Odyssey channel, where my colleagues and I attempt to answer really hard questions using the laws of math, physics, and common sense. Okay, so today I'm going to be exploring um, the physics of a baseball myth from Mythbusters Season 5, Episode 15. It's the cork bat versus the non-cork bat. Okay, really cool relevant physics here. Um, collisions, elastic versus inelastic collisions, coefficient of restitution, momentum, conservation of momentum, conservation of energy, and using the coefficient of restitution to compute after collision velocities given before collision velocities with and without energy losses. Okay, so here's the myth. The myth was a cork bat provides the batter a batting advantage. So cork bats aren't allowed in professional baseball. And the experiment the Mythbusters conducted was they simply allowed a cork bat and an uncorked bat to make contact with the ball, and they measured the velocity of the ball after impact to determine which bat had the advantage. Okay, so I'm going to do a lot of physical analysis on here, um, including some mathematical models I developed. And then we're going to talk about another issue which they didn't consider. Okay, for now I'm going to let you watch uh, key parts of the episode, and then we'll come back and discuss the physics. Now that we've seen a number of hits with a regulation bat, what the high-speed camera is telling us is that the ball is consistently leaving the cannon at 80 miles an hour, which happens to be about the speed of the Roger Clemens pitch. It's also leaving the bat once it gets hit at 80 miles an hour. The next thing we need to do is test how fast it leaves the bat when the bat is corked. If it leaves faster, that will answer our question. Three! That was a hit. That was a hit. The ball is over here. And the bat is still there. So, with See any what? luck, that's data. The ball is coming into the bat at about 80 miles an hour, but it is leaving that bat at half that speed at about 40 miles an hour. Our earlier data points with the normal uncorked bat had the ball leaving the bat pretty much at exactly the speed it was going towards the bat at. And these and both of our good data sets on the cork bat is leaving at half the speed. Loading your lumber with lightweight cork poses two problems. The bat might be lighter and easier to swing, but reduced weight means less energy delivered to the ball. Also, instead of adding extra spring, the cork actually absorbs some of the impact. Those two factors add up to blunted batting ability. Well, you know, one way or another, it looks like the guys that got caught using a cork bat got themselves suspended for nothing. Yeah, you know, while our sample size might have been small, our results were totally unambiguous. And every time a ball came off the cork bat, it was coming off at half the speed that it was off of a normal bat. Yeah, far from acting like a spring, it was a lot more like a sponge. I gotta say, this one is totally busted. Totally. It's busted. Okay, so you saw key parts of the episode. So, Mythbusters busted, or did they do a pretty good job? Uh, well, they showed that the uncorked bat had an advantage over the cork bat, so I think they came to the right conclusion. However, they weren't able to delineate precisely why. Um, the cork bat was lighter than the uncorked bat, so is the better performance of the uncorked bat due to the mass or due to the springiness? That's something I'm going to evaluate. They didn't run a key scenario. And that's that the, ladder, the lighter bat, the cork bat, would swing faster. I'm going to take a look at that as well. And they also didn't consider the fact that a cork bat would probably have more control. Okay, the scenarios I'm going to look at include a heavier versus lighter bat with and without conservation of energy. I'm going to keep the springs constant, the velocity constant, and change the mass. I'm going to look at cork versus uncorked bat. Uh, with a constant mass, one change the springiness and the velocity. A faster cork bat versus a slower uncork bat. Um, I'm going to change both mass as well as velocity, and then I'm going to look at also this one. A faster, lighter uncork bat versus slower uncork bat. So this is neither one of them are cork, but one's lighter. Will there be an advantage to just the lighter bat without the corkiness? Constant, constant, different velocities because the lighter bat will be able to impart a greater velocity to the bat. So, key issue, springiness. 
Um, so I had two extraordinary physics students, Ty and Kate, um, which did an experiment to determine uh, the loss of energy due to the springiness of a spring. And what they found was that the lower the spring constant, the more energy lost in the collision between the spring and a mass encountering the spring. Okay, so the more springy, the more energy lost. Um, and that's going to be relevant here in this analysis. Okay, so here are the experiments the Mythbusters conducted. Uh, they had a baseball bat moving at 26.8 meters per second, 60 miles an hour in one direction. The ball coming in at the opposite direction of 35.7 meters per second. Um, before impact and after impact, the ball left at 35.7 meters per second, so the same speed. Uh, the bat I computed to move at 16 meters per second using conservation of momentum. So all these were given except this. Okay, the cork bat scenario is similar, uh, identical before contact. After contact, uh, the ball left at half the velocity. Okay, 40 miles an hour, 17.9 uh, meters per second. Okay, so what I didn't know from the Mythbusters episode were the masses of the bat, uncorked, corked, and the ball, and I just looked this up. And also from the video, it appears that after the bat has been released by the spring, by the machine, there are no external forces acting on the bat. So I feel comfortable using uh, conservation of linear momentum in this analysis. Okay, so the first analysis I'm going to do is a heavier versus lighter bat with conservation of energy. Okay, so I want to keep the springiness the same, the velocity the same, I want to change the mass. Again, I think this was the weakness of the Mythbusters experiments. They allowed both this and this to vary. So they weren't able to, to, to uh, isolate which one was the most important, mass or springiness. Okay, I'm going to use conservation of energy law and the conservation of linear momentum. So conservation of linear momentum comes from Newton's third law. So let's say the one is the uh, ball and two is the bat. So the force on the bat due to the ball uh, is equal and opposite to the force on the ball due to the bat. Okay. So if you expand that, you can derive conservation of linear momentum, which is what I've done here. Okay. So these are the equations I'm going to use in this analysis: conservation of linear momentum and conservation of energy. Okay, what is momentum? So momentum is defined as the mass of something times its velocity. So for the bat, it's the mass of the bat times the velocity of the bat. And there are two different momentums here, one before the collision and one after, since they're traveling at two different speeds. So the momentum of the bat before the collision is the mass of the bat times the velocity of the bat before the collision. So V bat is comma I. Kinetic energy of the bat before the collision is one half the mass of the bat times the velocity of the bat before the collision squared. Now, conservation momentum says the momentum before the collision is equal to the momentum after the collision. Okay, the momentum before the collision is just the mass, the momentum of the bat plus the momentum of the ball. So these will be different. Okay. And then energy is the energy before the collision is equal to energy after the collision. That's assuming energy is conserved, and um, which is not the case in this episode, but it's what I'm going to assume initially in my initial analysis. Okay, I can use those two equations to derive the velocity of the bat and the ball after the collision. So that's pretty remarkable. I can find two unknowns because I have two equations. So when I apply those equations to the initial velocities of the bat and the ball, I got this. For the more massive bat, for the one kilogram bat, the ball after impact was moving at about 73 meters per second. For the less massive bat, the 0.75 kilogram bat, the ball is moving at 68.4. So I feel safe in concluding that the more massive the bat, the greater the velocity of the ball will be after the collision. Again, assuming energy is conserved. So what if energy is not conserved? So I can't use the conservation of energy equation or those previous equations. So what am I going to do now? So there's some really powerful physics. I'm going to use something called the coefficient of restitution. Okay, The coefficient of restitution is a number which provides information about the type of collision. And it's denoted by this Greek symbol epsilon. 
It depends primarily on the composition and the physical makeup of the two bodies. Once I've got that, and I need an experiment, an actual experiment to compute it, I can then use it to look at other types of similar collisions to approximate the velocities of each object after the collision. So I computed this statistic for the two Mythbusters experiments. The collision between the uncorked bat and the ball and the collision between the cork bat and the ball. This is the equation for the coefficient of restitution. It's the relative velocity between the bat and the ball before the collision. I'm sorry, it's the relative velocity between the bat and the ball after the collision divided by the relative velocity between the bat and the ball before the collision. Okay, these are vectors, so sign matters, direction matters. It's going to be either plus or minus, depending on whether it's going to the right or left. And this is the magnitude. So this will essentially give us positive numbers for the numerator and the denominator. We can then do a little bit of algebra on the momentum equations to derive the velocity of the ball after the collision and the velocity of the bat after the collision, as long as I know the coefficient of restitution. So this is what I'm going to apply to the scenarios that the Mythbuster didn't conduct, but should have. And I'm doing it virtually. So the computations I got, the coefficient of restitution for the collision between the uncorked bat and ball, 0.31, coefficient of restitution for the collision between the cork bat and the ball, 0 0.029. Now the closer the coefficient of restitution is to one, the more elastic the collision. The more elastic the collision, the less kinetic energy is lost. So clearly, based on this computation, more energy is lost in the collision between the cork bat and the ball than the uncorked bat and the ball. But these are two different masses. But I think it's safe to assume that the loss in energy is due primarily to the springiness of the bat versus the less mass of the bat. And that's the, an assumption I'm going to make here. Okay, here's just the details of the computation. For the uncorked bat, velocity of the bat after the collision is 16. Velocity of the ball after the collision is 35.7. This is the velocity of the bat before the collision. Uh, minus a minus, that's because the ball is coming in from the right to the left. I define to the left negative. Minus a minus, so it's 0.31. Similar uh, formula, obviously, for the cork, just slightly different numbers. So my analyses. Analysis number one. I looked at the collision between a one kilogram bat in the ball and a 0.7 kilogram bat in the ball. This is the result for the 0.75 kilogram bat. Both uncorked, so the higher coefficient of restitution. What I found for the lower mass bat is the velocity of the ball after collision 32.53 meters per second. Still on court, coefficient of restitution 0.31, more massive bat, the speed of the ball after collision 35.5. Okay, so assuming both bats are uncorked and have this, and one has a mass of one kilogram, the other has a mass of 0.75 kilograms. The more massive bat will provide for greater velocity to the ball after the collision. So the scenario with energy lost is the same in terms of a conclusion as the scenario with conservation of energy. The more massive bat, or a similar spring in this bat, will provide for a greater velocity to a ball after the collision. Okay, analysis number two. Cork versus uncorked bat. But now I'm going to keep the mass constant. Change in the springiness, I'm going to keep the velocity constant. And here's what I got. Springy bat, coefficient restitution 0.029, one kilogram bat, provided a final velocity to the ball of 20.22 meters per second. Same mass bat, but now uncorked, so it has a higher coefficient of restitution, provided a velocity to the ball of 35.5 meters per second. 
So clearly, if the bats are the same mass, and one is corked and the other one isn't, the uncorked bat will perform better. So analysis number three. Okay, this is a scenario where one player comes along and picks up a cork bat of 0.75 kilograms. The other one picks up the bat, uncorked bat, of 1 kilogram. And one's going to swing faster because for the same amount of force, a lighter bat will swing faster. So this varied and this varied. So all three varied. Mass, springiness, and velocity. But I don't know the velocity of a cork bat. That information wasn't given. The Mythbusters assumed a 26.8 meters per second bat, regardless of its mass. And again, I know why they did that. But I'm making the assumption that a lighter bat's going to swing faster. So what do I do? Well, I'm going to use Newton's second law in this form to solve for the force. Okay, so how much force was applied to that one kilogram bat to get it to go 80 miles per hour or 26.8 meters per second? Okay, if I multiply the mass times the velocity after the force is applied, divided by the time that the, um, that the machine was in contact with the bat, I'm saying 0 0.0007 seconds, I get a force of 38,285 newtons. Okay, so now I'm going to say that same force is applied to a lighter bat using the same equation. Okay, and I get 36 meters per second. Okay, makes sense. A lighter bat will swing faster, assuming the same force is applied to it. Then what I did was I plugged that number into the equations previously presented, and I was able to obtain a velocity of the ball after impact with the bat of 25.78 meters per second. Okay, the final scenario I ran was a faster, lighter uncorked bat versus a slower uncorked bat. Okay, so both bats are uncorked, one's lighter. What's going to happen? 0.75 kilogram bat provides a speed of the ball after impact of 42.57 meters per second. Coefficient restitution 0.31 because it's uncorked. Okay, so here are my results. Really interesting. Whether it's energy is conserved or not, a more massive bat uncorked will provide a greater velocity to the ball after impact. 72.9 versus 68.5. Conservation of energy here, energy loss, 35.5 versus 32.5. Here, same mass bat, one corked, one not. The corked bat delivered a speed of 20.2 meters per second, and the uncorked bat, the same mass, 35.5. Clearly, the uncorked bat outperformed the corked bat. So more massive, outperformed less massive, uncorked, outperformed corked. Cork bat swinging faster, underperformed. Underperformed the uncorked bat, swinging slower. 25.8 meters per second versus 35.5 meters per second. And then analysis number four is interesting. Both uncorked bats, one was lighter, and the lighter bat delivered a velocity to the ball of 42.6 meters per second, clearly the winner. Conclusion, the myth can be busted based on the episode data, so I, got, I think the Mythbusters got that right, but they did not know whether it was the lighter bat or the springiness of the cork bat that led to its inferior performance. They mentioned both probably contributed, but didn't know for sure which one had greater influence. And uh, using the mathematical, mathematical physics and data from the Mythbusters experiment to compute the coefficient restitution, I was able to conclude that the primary factor which makes the cork bat inferior is its greater springiness which results in higher energy loss. Okay, so something the Mythbusters didn't consider is control. Would a court bat provide more control? Um, I played tennis for years, and I recall 
when I strung my rackets at less tension, I felt I had more control. So, is this why a few players in the past have court their bats? Not because they wanted more power, because they wanted more control. So what I'm going to do in my next video is I am going to analyze how far a ball moving at 40 miles per hour would go into the outfield. Is it far enough for the players, say, to make it to first or second base? And then I'm going to look at how far a ball traveling at 80 miles per hour goes. And I'm going to use projectile motion with air resistance. And if it appears that the ball moving at 40 miles per hour, half the speed of that of an uncorked bat, makes it to, say, center field, uh, maybe not a home run or a triple, but can't get pretty far out in the outfield, maybe that's the explanation. Maybe that's why baseball players uh, occasionally, I think it's fairly rare, um, but, but use cork bats uh, in the past. So take a look at that episode. There's some pretty good physics there about projectile motion um, with and without air resistance. Thanks for watching. Hope this was helpful. Have a good day. Bye-bye.